Let's stand up. I want to just pray as we as we start. Father, thanks for Wes's uh, admonition and encouragement just to calm our hearts. Lord, I don't know about uh, other folks, but I know even this weekend uh, there were moments where my heart was racing. And we just thank you that we can come into this place and celebrate who you are, what you have done, what you are doing, and what you are going to do. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I was planning the music and talking with Wes and Katie uh, Tuesday in our meeting about the songs for this week. And I just want to let you know as a preview, we kind of are, um, you know, in, in reference to kind of what we talked about last week in terms of Scripture being one of the guardrails, and then this week talking about Jesus. And so the songs actually are kind of God of Wonders is kind of more of the Genesis song about the creation. The second song is In Christ Alone, which is obviously about Jesus. And the third song is Revelation song, which we'll do after communion. But that's kind of the, those are the bookends and the watershed moment in Scripture. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's just come to worship. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy. Holy Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth, early in the morning. I will celebrate the light when I stumble in the darkness. I will call your name by night, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy, the universe. Your Majesty, you are holy, holy Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. Precious Lord, reveal your heart to me. Father, hold me, oh, hold me. The universe declares your majesty. Hold me, hold me. You are holy, holy. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, universe declares your majesty, you 
are holy, holy, Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of heaven and earth, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still and striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand oh, 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 oh. by darkness slain and bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. oh, 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 oh. in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand oh, 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 oh. Oh, 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 oh. Christ alone, I give my life, 
yesterday uh, from Clemson and all I knew was that my daughter had fallen off a horse and was uh, at the hospital with a neck brace on and I jumped in the car I didn't know what I was driving to I'll tell you on the front end she's fine I uh, came home last night and wanted to get an Asahi bowl afterwards but um, there were moments driving down 85 when I just really had to uh, wrestle with the Lord and say, Lord, I just got to trust you. And this song was kind of playing in my head. And then I, I heard a song called You're Worthy of It All, which I'm just going to sing the chorus to that because it just really gave me a peace last night as I was driving. And it just reminded me that we have the bookends of the Bible in these songs and we have the, the guardrail of Jesus that's guarding our lives. Join in the course if you know. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. From you are all things. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Sing that with me. You're worthy of it all. Worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things. From you are all things to you. To you are all things you deserve. You deserve the glory. You're worthy of it all you're worthy of it all oh. for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory Lord from you are all things and to you are all things and you deserve the glory we give you that right now we thank you for this time and pray that we would hear your words from Wes as he speaks open our hearts open our minds that we might receive all that you have to say to us today we pray this in Jesus name amen you can be seated amen Well, again, welcome into Waypoint. Uh, it's a joy, it's a privilege to be able to be together, to be able to come in and just worship a God who is worthy of all things, uh, no matter what we've faced, whatever we've been driving to and from this week. Uh, just want to, again, just highlight, we're going to celebrate communion after at the end of today's service, and so uh, we're going to celebrate it by using these little individual cups. And so if you came in and didn't get a communion cup. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand, uh, Mark Howell will help you. And I'm thinking the guy's up in the balcony too, so you're going to get your workout in. So just as you gather the cup, we're going to talk today about the guardrail of Christ alone. That is an amazing thing as you hold on to this. To just consider throughout this service, this idea, we're going to declare that this is a remembrance of Christ's body and blood given over for you. That whatever you've been through, whatever sin, whatever brokenness, whatever shame, whatever hurt you've experienced, 
whatever fear you might have, that this little cup is going to be able to remind you of the sweetness and the goodness of God. That I love the lines we sang. Sometimes I can be so focused on trying to not sound horrible singing that I can lose. Uh, But I love these lines. I find my strength, I find my hope, I find my help in Christ alone. And so I'd invite you, whatever else I might share today, as you're preparing your heart for communion, for the body and blood of Christ, to consider that. Is this the place you find your strength, find your hope, find your help? For that's what we're going to declare today. And so if you're visiting here at Waypoint, our mission, our vision, our hope, our goal at Waypoint, we say is wherever you are spiritually, Maybe you're here checking out God for the first time in a while. Maybe you're here because a parent or a significant other has kind of drug you to church. Maybe you're here because you're just eager, eager to see what God might want to do in and through your life. Wherever you are spiritually, we pray that waypoint, our goal is to draw you one step closer to Jesus, to know the strength and the hope and the help of him, and then, and then push you out into the streets in service of his name. And so Waypoint, our our goal, we want to be an equipping church. We want to help you know what it is you believe. And so we've been doing this series this fall called The Solas. We're looking at the five guardrails of Waypoint. These are the five kind of core essential beliefs of Waypoint that we look and we see the five solas. Solas is a Latin word for alone. That we believe in God alone, Scripture alone, Jesus alone, grace alone, and faith alone. But these are kind of the essentials to our faith. Augustine, in about 400, 500, had a great little line that he wrote. He was a pastor, and he wrote, he goes, you know, we need to have unity in the essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and charity in all things. What he's saying is we need to be unified as a body, as a believer, as a community around the essentials. And then the non-essentials, the stuff that churches and people fight about all the time, we, we need to actually just have liberty on that. But in all things, we should show charity. And so these five guardrails, we say, are kind of the essentials to the Christian faith. God alone, the two weeks ago we talked about that. It's God who's in charge, not me. Right there, that claim, it's God who's in charge, not me, is a really big claim. That if you make that profession that God's in charge of your life, we said suddenly everything else kind of falls into place. And then last week, Chip talked about Scripture alone. And we say that Scripture shapes who we are. We don't get to come to Scripture and let it make it say whatever we want it to say. We need to read Scripture with a position of humility and let it read us, shape us. And today we're going to talk about Christ alone, that Jesus is the way and prepares the way back to the Father. And then next week we'll talk about faith, that we're saved by faith, not by works, and ultimately grace, that because of God's grace in our life, we respond and everything we do is seeking to show grace to the world around us. And so if you were here last week, Chip talked about Scripture alone, that it all kind of starts in Scripture. And as we sang those songs, he kind of is walking us through the whole body of Scripture that way. And one of the lines in the Waypoints Guardrails that I love is we say that we believe that Scripture is infallible. And what we mean by that is it will not fail us. It will not lead you astray. That if you come to Scripture and allow Scripture to read you, you might not like what it says. You might not like the direction and the path it leads you down. But if you allow it to read you, it will not fail you. It will not fail you. See, in Isaiah, Isaiah says it well. He writes, And he says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. That for all of us in our own hearts, we're we're like sheep. That we've wandered and we've gone astray. All of us want scripture, want life to kind of go our way. And we'd rather wander off, go our own way on this. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. I don't know if you're like me, but whenever I pull up ways, I mean, even today using these GPS apps, I think I know better than the Waze app. 
Yesterday I was down in Greenville watching a Dude Perfect show with my kids driving back in the middle of the night, and I dialed in the Waze Directions home. And I'd never been to this part of Greenville before, but I was convinced that I knew better the twists and the turns of how to get out of the traffic and all of that, that this, I was better than the computer algorithm. And so I ended up going through all this neighborhood, getting lost, thinking I was going to have to call Whitney Sturge to get me some directions out of this city. That we all, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us think we've got a better route to this life. And we'd rather take our own ways. And then, and then what ends up happening, like this woman, we drive into the lake and we want to blame the GPS on this. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We would rather go our own way rather than seeking what is the way Jesus of Jesus Christ. See, Isaiah continues that passage, and he says, well, he says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You know, I've, I've memorized this verse. I've prayed this verse. I've said this verse over and over again. And I always stumble over it because I want to say, but the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And I have to remind myself, no, it's and. And. It's not in contrast to our wandering, but it's because of our wandering that Jesus took upon himself all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of our mess. He took that iniquity on us all. That, that we need a guide to show us the way. That guardrail is that Jesus is the way and prepares the way for us. He shows us the right way of living. See, Jesus' story is a man, God who became fully human, who goes through every broken experience you and I could have, that Jesus knows this way of pain, of suffering, of hurt, of loss. The week, the week that Jesus was to be arrested and crucified, he was betrayed by one of his best friends, Judas. He was rejected by his closest friend, Peter. He knows what it feels like to be betrayed by people in your life. Jesus knows the pain of losing his friend Lazarus. He weeps over the death of a close friend. And it's very possible that he had lost his earthly father, Joseph, when he was a young man. That Jesus understands the pain of being a fatherless, watching death happen. And ultimately, Jesus understands the pain of sin. That on the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He feels the weight of our sin, all of the iniquity on his shoulders. See, Jesus, literally in the Apostles' Creed, we say Jesus descended into hell. Jesus experienced hell for three days. So if you feel like you're going through hell, know that Jesus is there with you. Jesus has been there. And the good news of the gospel is that after three days, he rose to a new life. And he invites us to say, come, follow me. Follow me out of the gates of this hell you're going through. That's what we claim with this Christ alone. That it's through Christ alone that we find our salvation, we find our hope, we find our strength, our help. And so today we're going to look at John 14. That if you've got your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open them up. If you've got your phone with you, I invite you to go to Bible Gateway or whatever app you have and go to John 14 because we're going to look at this passage together. John is one of the four gospel writers. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke kind of tell their story together in a very similar way. John is more poetic in the way he delivers his story, and he picks up this, in chapter 14, picks up this long sermon Jesus gives his friends on. And so as you find John 14, let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would speak today, that whatever words bounce around in my brain would just go away so that we could hear your word, your good news. For Christ, it is you alone that we worship and we just long for you. So God, would you open our ears to hear you? Would you open our eyes that we might see you? Would you open our hearts that we might feel you this day? We pray this in your son's name. Amen. To John 14, 6 is this kind of famous phrase you might have heard before. 
where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I was at a funeral at a church just around the corner from here, one of the big steeple churches in town here. And we were sitting there grieving the loss of a friend when the pastor stood up to read John 14 for us. And in your heading in your Bible, it might say Jesus comforts his disciples. And so the pastor got up and read 14, and he goes to John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he skips over that and goes to verse 7. Now, I've warned you all. I've always said, notice if a pastor ever puts the three little ellipses and ever skips over a passage. Notice what he skips over and notice what's missing. So somebody who's got their Bible with them, if you wouldn't mind just standing up and reading the rest of verse 6 for us. You got it, Sandy? Yeah, I'm pointing to you. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And we're there grieving in this funeral. And he jumped over this passage. And I knew the passage, and it, it, it hurt because I saw the pastor missed an opportunity to bring comfort to his people. I know, I think the pastor cut that out because he was afraid of being exclusive or maybe judgmental. But he missed the words of comfort in Jesus' saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is saying this to his disciples who are scared and anxious. Jesus is saying this to you and to me as we worry and we wonder. And what he's saying is no one comes to the Father. No one comes home to that love of God except through me. There's nothing you have to do to earn it. Nothing you have to do to receive it. It doesn't matter so long as you see that Jesus is the way and receive the gift that Jesus invites you to follow. It's an invitation. It's a word of comfort. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It's an invitation to come back home that no matter what you've done, whatever you've faced, whatever shame and guilt you have over the past, whatever anxiety or worry you have over the future, Jesus is saying, it's about me. It's about Christ alone. Know that I've gotten all that taken care of, and you can follow me home to this Savior, to this hope we have. Because you see, the reality is being good is not being Christian. I was working with a disciple and a young man, and I, I was talking with him about this. I said, truthfully, being good isn't what it's about being a Christian. And he looked at me and he goes, wait, wait then I don't know what it means to be a Christian. I said, yeah, yeah, see, see, being good isn't what it's about being a Christian. The golden rule, Matthew, where Jesus says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto me, this good moral living, that is found in every major world religion. That's not unique to the Christian faith. Moral living is not being Christian. But for some reason, that's what we've boiled this down to. Quite frankly, if you've been here before, you've kind of heard me throw out this big phrase before, but American Christianity has really become this big idea of moralistic therapeutic deism. Let me translate it. Here's what I mean by that. Be good, be happy. God's there if you need him. That's what we teach our youth. That's what we teach our children. That's kind of, if we're honest, that's a lot of how we behave. That this Christian faith is just about being good, being happy, and God's there if you need him. But that's not the story of Jesus. That's not the story of the gospel. Paul says, there's no one who's righteous. No, not a single one. If I was honest to y'all, I am not good. You are not good. You're never going to be good enough. Happy? Happiness is not a concept in Scripture. Happiness is about just this fleeting emotion that's based purely on whatever circumstance or situation you've got going on. Happiness comes and goes. What the gospel promises us is joy, is peace. A joy, joy is about a contentment no matter what's happening. Scripture talks about a peace that passes all understanding. See, the invitation of the gospel is joy and peace, not happiness. And then deism, deism is this idea that there is this kind of God idea out there, but, but it's just an it. 
Life's really up to me. When we were starting Waypoint, I did a little demographic study of this sort of area of South Charlotte and what uh, stood out to me about five, six years ago, and I would imagine the statistics have only gotten uh, less and less, was the first thing I noticed is that it said that 68% of people, nearly two-thirds of people, believed that God existed. That most in this wedge, in this South Charlotte area, believe in the concept of God. Most of us hold to this deistic idea that there is a God out there, a God of the universe. But then the other statistic that was interesting to me was only 52% of us believe that he has a day-to-day impact on our lives. That half of us don't believe that he matters day in and day out. We're happy to think about God as a big idea, but we don't see the day-after-day need for him in our lives. I mean, if you look at how wealthy and educated and and privileged this pocket is, we're so used to doing it on our own that this idea that, oh, there's a God, but I'm going to do it day in and day out on my own. And so that's why this mission of Waypoint is to drive this home, that we need Jesus. We need Christ alone to be our strength, to be our help, to be our hope. And there's comfort found in that. That's, That's why Jesus was saying these words Again, John 14, uh, last week a good preacher said that context is king. you got to know what's going on around this. That Jesus is speaking to his disciples as he's about to go be crucified, dead, and buried, and resurrected. Jesus is speaking to them, and there is worry and fear about the future, about what's going to happen. They're unsure and uncertain of what tomorrow holds. And so Jesus speaks these words of comfort to them. Listen to how it begins. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Honestly, let's just, if you don't take anything else away this morning, take that line right there. Jesus' invitation, don't let your hearts be troubled. Whatever you're facing, whatever you've got going on, don't let your hearts be troubled. For you believe in God, you believe in the idea of God, but also believe in me, believe in Jesus Christ. For my Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? That the promise of Jesus is I'm going to prepare a heavenly place for you to return to your Father's house, to go home, to satisfy all that longing, all that worry, all that want you have. He's going to build a home for you. A home. And if you go If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also go where, may be where I am. See the invitation to come with me. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I love Thomas. He he wanted the way's directions, the map, the GPS. He wanted to do it on his own. And so Jesus comes back and says, no, 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 no. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's an incredibly inclusive, exclusive invitation. Everyone is welcome to me to come through me to the Father. If you really know me, then you will know my Father as well. And so from now on, you do know him and have seen him. That's the invitation. He goes on, Jesus does in this Time and three times, excuse me, four times, he invites the disciples to abide in me, to reside in me, to rest in me. The invitation is to stop working so hard and to rest, to abide. Abide in me. See, that's where the good news is found because it's not on our shoulders. The Lord lays upon him the iniquity of us all. It's on Jesus' shoulders for us. That Jesus has done this. There's an old hymn maybe you've sung in the past called Jesus Paid It All. That that phrase, Jesus Paid It All, I was driving up in the mountains last week and I saw one of those little crosses where they had that phrase kind of stenciled on there, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All. Jesus has done it all for you. So you don't have to. Think about going to a restaurant. You sit down with somebody, you're having a meal, and the the waiter comes up at the end of the restaurant, at the meal, and asks, is it going to be one check or two? And you kind of have that awkward, like, trying to figure out what's going on here. 
you kind of do the fake reaching for your wallet. Well, maybe if you're me. But, <laughs> but you're trying to figure out what's going on here. Who's going to pay? And then the bill's picked up by the other person. And you kind of feel weird. Don't you? Like, don't, wouldn't you rather pay for it yourself? Why? Because we want to feel like we can earn it. We can do it. But, but Jesus paid it all. He picked up that tab for you. And so all, all it requires of us is to say thank you. To smile and show gratitude. And to receive that gift. The gift of Jesus Christ alone. And it's there, it's there we find the good news. For if we're honest, we, we need to admit that our sin is much greater and a much bigger deal than we dare to admit. We were honest with ourselves and honest with God. Our sin is far bigger than we dare to admit. We're far dirtier and messier. We'll never be good enough. We're never going to be happy. It's never going to satisfy. But, but the promise of the good news is that we're loved by God far more than we dare to imagine. If our sin is far greater than we dare to admit, then that means the love of God is far greater than you could ever, ever fathom. And so we gather in worship to proclaim this, to proclaim this good news, that we worship a God who feeds us. See, the difference between Christianity and all other faith is that we worship a God who feeds us. We don't have to bring our food, our offerings to him. He sets the table and wants to feed us. David says it in the psalm. He says, you do not delight God in the sacrifice where I bring it. You don't take pleasure in the burnt offerings. You don't take pleasure in the carcass of an animal burning up. You don't want me to feed you, O oh Lord. He says, my sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. What God wants is our broken hearts, our confessions and our admissions, because there in our brokenness, we discover a God who will feed us, that everything we long for is satisfied through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. That's why we gather around this communion table. We gather around this communion table to remember this. To not just go through a ritual, not just go through the emotions, but to see the demonstration of God's goodness for us. To see the body and the blood of Christ given for us. To satisfy our deepest longings, our greatest hurts, our hungers. And so we gather around this table. God says that people will come from the north and the south and the east and the west and sit at table together. That this is the Lord's table because he's the one feeding us. And so as you prepare your hearts, prepare your minds to come and eat at this table, think about what you're hungry for. Where do you need that strength, that help, that hope we sang about? Where do you need Christ to satisfy that longing? Is it in a relationship? Is it in a sin? Is it in an addiction? Is it in a brokenness? Is it in just a longing for something more? Because this, this table satisfies that deepest longing. And so, friends, as we prepare for this meal, let me just pray over this table. Heavenly Father, you are the creators of the heavens and the earth. You hung the stars in the sky and you created me and you created each one of us. Lord, you formed us out of the dirt of the ground, yet you then breathed the gift of life into us. God, you love us, yet we decided to go our own way. We rejected you and turned our back on you and thought we knew better and we could do this on our own. And even though we rejected you, you did not reject us, but sent your son, Jesus Christ, into this world to show us the way back home. 
And so, Lord, I ask that you would come. May your spirit come now upon this bread and upon this cup, upon our hearts. Lord, would you take these ordinary things, these day-to-day things we encounter, and would you transform them into an extraordinary reminder of how much you love us. Lord, as we taste and see your goodness, may we feel the cleansing power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray and joining together with those disciples who are worried and wondering what was next. Lord, we join with the disciples praying together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So on that night, on that Thursday night, Jesus gathered his friends around the table. He invited them to come and to sit with him and to dine with him. And then, in the middle of the supper, he took bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that's been broken for you. The body that was strung out on the cross was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, I invite you to take that wafer, to take that bread as a reminder of God's broken body given for you. And then after supper, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup, this cup is the sign of a new covenant. It's a sign of a new promise Jesus is making. That through his blood, he said, through the shedding of my blood, is given for the forgiveness of your sins. That whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the rising life of Jesus Christ. Friends, this this cup, this cup is the cup of salvation. It's a promise that your sins have been paid for, have been wiped away that you are loved by God no matter what. So friends, when you're ready, taste and sweetness of God's love for you. Amen. I hadn't told this story in a while, but this chalice I got uh, when I felt called into ministry. Uh, I picked it up as a young man. And there's a little hairline crack that runs through the middle of it. And so every time I get to celebrate communion with you guys, if you notice, I'll bump out 
the way the other elders and stuff to make sure I get my cup. And then I'll turn this crack towards me. And back when we did intinction, I, it was to be a visual reminder of my brokenness, of my need for this cup. As I got to proclaim that good news for you, that this is the body of Christ broken for you, the cup of salvation given for you. Friends, this is why we worship. It's not about us. but It's about seeing a God who loved us so much to give himself away to us. So would you just join me as we pray? Lord, we have been nourished by you. Lord, you set this table and you invited us. Some of us don't know why we were ended up here today, but may we leave here knowing why we came here. Lord, I thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. And so could we leave here, Lord, knowing that while we're not good enough, we can receive your joy and peace and move forward in hope this day and forevermore. Amen. Seen in honor, strength, and glory, and power be to you, the only wise King. Oh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Oh. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I will adore you. You're worthy of it all. Oh, you're worthy of it all. Let's just sing that chorus again. Holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Friends, as y'all head out, I invite you to wrestle with that question, with that lyric. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Is Jesus Christ your everything? I would invite you, if you want to know what it means, what it looks like to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, to bow down before him, Chip and I would love to just talk with you about that. How to let it go and to trust in Christ alone. And so may God the Father who created you, who knows you, watch over you. May He protect you. And may Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, show you that way back home because no one comes to the Father except through Him. May he invite you home so that you can feel the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that brings you all love, hope, and joy that you need this day and forevermore. Amen. Waypoint, I love you guys. Y'all have a great week. I look forward to being with y'all next week as well. Praise God.